Okay, I think we'll start. Welcome. So glad to have you join the Mayo Clinic Florida Virtual Residency Open House. My name is Dr. Mark McKinney. I am the Senior Associate Dean of Graduate Medical Education at Mayo Clinic here in Florida. I will be your host tonight, and I'm looking forward to a great evening with many uh, interesting speakers. It's a beautiful evening here in Florida with a few scattered showers. The view of my virtual background is actually our view here of, of our campus and the ocean in the background. Last evening, I was able to take a walk along that ocean and enjoy the sunset. And I wish all of you could be here in person with us. Graduate medical education at Mayo Clinic in Florida is well established with over 65 programs and over 300 residents and fellows. I wanna to say tonight a huge thank you to Dr. Elizabeth Mauricio, our program director for neurology. Dr. Mauricio has organized this session and the speakers and has done this for several years. It's a valuable asset to um, our graduate medical education experience here every year, and we're glad that you can enjoy it with us. Tonight, after the main session, we will have breakouts uh, approximately at 7.30. These breakouts will be selections you can choose on your screen. The program has the list of the departments that are participating. We ask for your patience as you select uh, to connect to the breakout sessions because with the number of attendees, it'll take just a few seconds or minutes to get everyone to their uh, room. And of course, our IT support personnel will help any and all if there are any challenges. So let's get started. I'm looking forward to it. I want to introduce um, our first speaker, Dr. Margaret Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson is a personal friend of mine. She's the Dean of Education at Mayo Clinic Florida and she's a strong supporter of graduate medical education. She is also a professor of medicine and a pulmonary critical care physician. She is going to start with our welcome and overview. Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. McKinney. Um, I'm glad you were out on the beach last evening. Uh, I was out there Sunday and I, uh, I share your opinion of the beauty of our, our locale here. It's just awesome, folks. Um, I echo Dr. McKinney's welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it is really our pleasure to share Mayo Clinic with all of you and share it through the lens of you prospectively joining us here at Mayo Clinic. As Dr. McKinney mentioned, um, I'm the Dean of Education on the Florida campus. So in this role, I help to oversee each of our training programs in our, in our different schools, including the School of Graduate Medical Education, um, which is the largest school on, on the Florida campus. And as Dr. McKinney mentioned, we have 301 residents and fellows here uh, enjoying their training, enjoying it, I'd say, most of the time. There's probably some rough days here or there. I could go on and on about Mayo Clinic, and I will to some extent, but before I speak too much, I really would like to ask each of you as our, our guest tonight to pause and just reflect on where you are in your life. You've been on an incredible journey. You are about to choose a residency after finishing medical school. That's a tremendous accomplishment. And I would ask you, please don't lose sight of the tremendous accomplishments you have had up till this point as you, you know, em embrace all the chaos of trying to find a residency. You've done great work. Pause, reflect on that, and pat yourself on the back. You have so much to be proud of. Getting to this point of choosing a residency in one's medical journey is so exciting. There's so many possibilities, so many doors that could open for you. But I appreciate along with that excitement, it can be maybe a little nerve wracking, maybe too many choices, maybe uncertainties. Please relax. I'm confident that each of you will make the best decision and you will be at the place you're meant to be. I'm particularly biased and I think the place to be is Mayo Clinic in Florida. And I can give you lots of reasons why I think Mayo Clinic in Florida is the place for you to be. But really, I would ask you most importantly, take, take the time tonight to learn about our programs, 
learn about our institution, learn about our history, and most importantly, do a gut check. Is Mayo Clinic Florida the right place for you? How does one choose a residency? How does one figure out if it, this is the right place for you? And there's lots of things that go into that equation. But I, I asked one resident this uh, at a, about a few years ago, and he said he chose a program or he valued a program that he realized also valued him. And I'm confident that all of our programs would en engender in each of you as a resident that feeling of being valued. We appreciate all that our trainees bring to our institution. They keep us on our toes. They keep us smarter. They take great, each of our residents help to take great care of our patients. They advance the science and they make for uh, coming to work for each of us on staff a better day. So again, thank you for joining us tonight. I so appreciate your time. I welcome all of you to our campus virtually. And as Dr. McKinney and I pointed out, we wish we could share it with you in person. Um, please learn about our programs tonight and assess if Mayo Clinic Florida is the place for your graduate medical education. I am confident that each of you can uh, achieve excellent education here, and more importantly, feel valued as a doctor, as a colleague, and as a person. So thanks for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. And Dr. McKinney, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. I really appreciate the practical advice that you shared with our attendees on choosing a residency. And I really like your background showing the atrium in one of our buildings. Our next speaker is Dr. Alfredo Quinones. Dr. Quinones is the Dean of Research here at Mayo Clinic Florida. He is the prior chair of neurosurgery and a professor of neurosurgery, and he's also a good friend. Dr. Quinones is going to give us his wisdom on research and mentorship. Dr. Quinones. Well, thank you, Dr. McKinney, and thank you, Dr. Johnson. I, I got the easiest job, and I apologize because apparently my slides show and the subtitles of what I'm saying, so it's, uh, it's trying to translate. So just for those who may not understand my accent, just uh, an extra added level of security right here. So I got the easiest job, everybody, because I have to tell you about a shield that I think it's extraordinary at this campus, that is research. I've been privileged to have uh, served as the Dean of Research for almost two years now in November and moved to this institution eight years ago is going to be this September. And I've been so extraordinarily blessed and impressed, you know, to see the extraordinary progress that has happened. Just over the last few years since I've been here, I've seen a tremendous growth in research, not only in the total research that uh, we see on the campus from extramural funding to federal funding, it is impressive to see the growth that has happened over the past 35 years at this campus. Just over the last year alone, in 2024, just up until now, we have had already a 16% higher growth as compared to 2023 when it comes to total research. When it comes to extramural funding, a 25% a plus higher than in 2023 already, and in federal funding, over 15% also higher than 2023. So we are really in a trajectory for growth that is unprecedented. That is a reflection of the talent that we see on the screen here and all the faculty that we have, in addition to the fact that we have an extraordinary campus that continues to grow. When we look at the growth and we look at the total research expenditures, you can see a 200, almost a 300% growth just from 2015 to 2023, over the last eight years that I've been here, when we look at extramural funding, over 300% growth in the last eight years. It's just been a rocket ship growing and growing in ways that just allow us to dream of better therapies, of discovering new therapies that we can apply to our patients so that way we can make their lives much 
much, much better. And that is really the vision that we have in research. We look at the federal funding, you can actually see the tremendous growth, 340% growth of the past eight years. The research personnel also, we continue to grow and the amount of people that we have that were hired in our laboratories, the scientists, the, the uh, health uh, sort of team that allows us to do what we do every single day. You know, clinical trials are really, truly something that allows to put therapies back on patients. And I think that's something that we all appreciate as clinicians, as clinician scientists. That's another reason why the demand and the interest in our residency here at the Mayo Clinic in Florida is unprecedented. Just right now, as of a few months ago, we have almost 800 total open uh, clinical trials, the highest that we ever had on the on any of the campuses, a 1.4% 1. growth over 2022, 256 new trials that were open, most ever that we had in 2022. And of course, we are getting more efficient and making sure that those trials is not just about opening the trials, but also having people and patients into the trial. That's also a tremendous growth. When we look at the clinical trials, you can actually see same thing as before, a rocket ship just really taking off in ways that really inspire us to do more and more for our patients. Just think about this. Three decades ago, this place where we are, and you're going to see more and learn more, was just a piece of land. There was not even a building here just over, about 35 years ago. And now we are beginning to see, this is our, our research sort of enterprise. Those are the buildings. The building right in the center is going to be the new building that we're about to open and research you know, over the next three to five years. Actually, our growth in net square footage just for research alone is really something that allows our residents to be able to do the work that they wanted to do to, to meet the demands of patients in regards to, uh, to new therapies. That is our campus. We have uh, it really over 600 acres of buildable space. We have already planned our growth over the next you know, 100 years. And that is a very conservative estimate. We really have our medical school, our residence, which is a priority for us integrating for the, with the shield of research and then with the patient practice. Tremendous engagement. These are some of the things that you'll see, that you'll hear about it, not only collaborative efforts with other uh, enterprises, with other institutions, but we have awards for our residents and fellows on research. We have a new community engagement center. So for those who really want to be part and integrate into the community. We, of, ho of course, have tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, retreats and all the different chills, all the different departments, several departments on the clinical, on the, in the clinical sciences and the basic sciences available to all of you, to all our residents who are applying right here. And of course, at the end, it's all about people, space, and technology. You see some of our fellows, some of our residents here picture with different people and different events. So overall, a tremendous amount of progress at our campus and a great opportunity for people to do the work that you want to do, for all your dreams to become a reality. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Liz, for allowing me to show something very easy to show, which is inspiring the work that our team at Mayo Clinic in Florida is doing. Thank you. Dr. Quinones, thank you so much. That's an amazing uh, set of slides that you shared with us showing the growth in research on our campus. I'm so glad you've chosen to be here the past eight years. It's been a great uh, ride so far and looking forward to even greater things uh, in the future to come. So again, thank, thank you, you for sharing. Our next speaker tonight is someone that I work with in graduate medical education, and that is Dr. Leila Tolomat. Dr. Tolomat um, is the Associate Dean of Graduate Medical Education. She is an Assistant Professor of Dermatology, and Dr. Tolomat has spent a um, significant amount of time helping graduate medical education in the area of innovation. And tonight, she will share with us some of those projects and opportunities for our residents and fellows. Dr. Tolomat. Thank you so much, Dr. McKinney. It's a pleasure to be here. And I wanna thank all the attendees for joining us today. Um, and I do wanna share one of my passions um, with the group and that's talking about the clinician innovator 
and educational opportunities that are available for residents and fellows um, who come to Mayo Clinic. So I think one of the things that we're always struck by uh, at Mayo Clinic is pushing the needle forward. And um, you can have that sense of energy from Dr. Q talking about research, and I think the same goes for innovation. So we ask ourselves, what does medicine look like 30 years from now? And so as we think and ponder, I think there are some key themes that emerge. First is AI and technological integration. We hope to improve personalized and precision medicine. And we know that our care is gonna need hybrid and also preventive approaches. We are gonna work through remote and on-demand care. We wanna automate and become more efficient with the care that we deliver. And um, we hope within this innovation that we're able to adapt. And we wanna reach all our patients and keep in mind access for all and equity in the healthcare that we provide. So we wanted to set up a unique opportunity for trainees um, in the area of innovation. And this will allow them to explore the intersection of medicine, technology, and business, and help them to develop skills to bring medical technologies from the concept to commercialization. So our programs are gonna focus on three key elements. First, technology translation, then business acumen, and also um, the entrepreneurship mindset. So in terms of technology translation, it's important to be able to identify promising technologies. And this is much easier to do uh, as a trainee as you start to develop your clinical expertise because you'll be able to form um, questions based on problems that come from clinical practice. You also want to be able to assess the feasibility and navigate the process of commercialization. It's also really important to understand patient needs um, and regulatory bodies, as well as business dynamics. For business acumen, um, it's important to learn healthcare revenue models, um, the market and uh, financial management, as these are all um, important skills we don't necessarily learn in medical school. Um, and depending on your training program, they may not be readily available. We also want you to develop business cases and look to attract um, investments, and then also being able to, to manage um, scaling up um, the business thought as well as managing challenges. In terms of an entrepreneurship mindset, this is really fostering creative thinking. Um, you do want to take risks, but you want them to be calculated. And unfortunately, we're all going to have failures and we want to show resilience um, in spite of those failures and be able to, to learn from our mistakes. Um, and, as, and really taking this failure as learning opportunities. So our innovation programs through um, the Mayo Clinic uh, School of Graduate Medical Education currently um, has two prongs. The first is um, the academy, and this offers our learners broad exposure. So this is for trainees who are trying to understand the process of clinical innovation and entrepreneurship and um, are interested in understanding what it takes from going from an idea to implementation. Um, the next set of curriculum is the elective, and I call this the deep dive. So this is for trainees who already have a project in mind, um, and they want to spend the time testing their idea, validating it, pitching the idea um, so that we can go from the project idea um, to building a business model. And so I'll start with a story um, that uh, began at Mayo Clinic in Florida. And before we took this on um, as the Mayo Clinic School of Graduate Medical Education, even though this was something that we had wanted to do in innovation, someone always has to be the person to pilot and think of the idea. And so the vision really came from Dr. Mary Hedges, who is our program director of internal medicine. And, you know, I think that she had a really clear vision and really feels that innovation is not an intuitive process, but despite that, it can be a skill set that is learned. So she wanted to bring this on to her internal medicine uh, program. And uh, fortunately, uh, she was able to recruit Dr. Abdullah El-Sabag, who's an international 
an interventional cardiologist, but also um, an expert innovator. And he was able to create a curriculum for the internal medicine program. And this um, had several pillars, uh, but the three major ones is to inspire, to acquire knowledge, and to apply that knowledge in the area of clinical innovation. So this model was so successful in their internal medicine program that this year we're expanding it to uh, graduate medical education. And so uh, fellows and residents of any training program are able to apply for the academy. Um, and the academy actually has structures in all three sites, um, including the Midwest, Arizona, and here in Florida. So the picture there is uh, one of the sessions with Dr. Elsa Bog, who is the director who runs our Florida Academy. Um, and this is within our beautiful innovation building. So the structure of the Academy, it's a one year program runs roughly from July to June, and it's one day a month. Um, and this is really geared towards those later in their residency training or in fellowship. And the reason is, is you have to have enough clinical knowledge um, to be able to identify problems within your clinical practice. And this is thought to be the best ideas for innovation. So some of the learning objectives from the academy is to really engage and inspire our future innovators who are our residents um, through storytelling and question and answer sessions. Um, as a group, you can brainstorm clinical needs and put potential solutions together. Um, it's important to use different technologies. So AI is one of the technologies that um, are studied. You also get to visit and network with different medical uh, technology companies. You'll get a broad understanding of the business of medicine. And then this really helps um, our participants to develop basic skills to evaluate, design, protect, develop, and fund medical innovations. The next learning structure that we have is an elective. And as I had mentioned, this is a deep dive. So this would be taken over uh, a month's elective time and you meet once a week. Uh, typically you have a four hour synchronous course and then there's gonna be about eight to 10 hours of asynchronous work that's done. Um, we offer four months out of the year for the rotation. And here really this focuses on the problem or project idea that's bought, brought by that individual participant. And so you are going to have hopefully the ability to assess um, an idea and understand if that can be um, brought to commercialization, um, the ability to structure customer interviews in order to get impactful feedback, and then be able to um, bring up the concept so that it can lead to commercialization. And what we love from all these um, innovation curricula is the comments that we get from our trainees. Um, here are just some examples, but they do find that it's an invaluable experience and it helps to address a gap that maybe we can't do within our um, individual programs, but coming together as the School of Graduate Medical Education, um, we can provide these exceptional learning experiences for our trainees. And I would like to um, thank uh, our uh, group um, who's involved in innovation. Um, it takes a village to bring this uh, forward. Um, and so I hope you learn enjoying about innovation and the other curricula that is offered by uh, MCS GME outside of your individual programs. Thank you. Dr. Toloman, thank you. One thing I've learned is change is a constant. So sharing how we can give these skills to our residents with innovation and adaptability, I think is very important. And it was very enlightening to understand both the academy and the elective options uh, that uh, these programs offer. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Leslie Simon. Dr. Simon is the chair of our Experiential Learning Center, as well as the fellowship director for the Medical Simulation Program. She's also the chair of Emergency Medicine and is an associate professor. Dr. Simon is going to share with us now on simulation-based learning.
Dr. Simon. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. And I get to talk to you about my absolute favorite place at Mayo Clinic, which is the Experiential Learning Center. Let's see here. So we opened in 2012 um, with the help of a generous gift from the Weaver family when they sold the Jacksonville Jaguars. And part of the condition of this gift was that the simulation center would be a resource, not just for Mayo Clinic employees and trainees and staff, but also for the community. And that is something that makes this a really special place because while you're training up there, you're just as likely to see, you know, firefighters or paramedics or the military or the Boy Scouts as you are to see medical students. In 2018, we expanded, and this is when we became the Experiential Learning Center from the Sim Center when we opened the Procedural Skills Lab. So this is a large multi-purpose lab that's used by most specialties at Mayo Clinic for procedural training. Last summer, we expanded further and we opened the Skull Base Lab. And this lab is used primarily by uh, neurosurgery and ENT, but it's, but it's open to other disciplines as well. They say that an amateur practices until they get something right, but a professional practices until they can't get it wrong. So we have a task training room that has multiple different simulators. And as a trainee at Mayo Clinic, your badge will open this room so you can practice to your heart's content. There are several different simulators and you're, they're available to you 24 seven. Um, this is the Sectra table. This was designed to be a, a virtual cadaver for anatomy training, but it also is unique in that it will interface with our PAC system. So you can look at images from actual patients. You can record from this. You can manipulate the images and see them in all different directions. So it's a great resource. Uh, we've also added several virtual and augmented reality options. Um, it's a great way to train and there are uh, lots of opportunities for innovation in this space. We have 3D printing. We have a much larger 3D printing lab at Mayo Clinic, but we have smaller ones in the Sim Center. So if you need a task trainer or a piece for a simulation exercise, it's easy for us to help you uh, develop these types of things on your own. We have multiple different high fidelity simulators. This is Victoria. Uh, she's our pregnancy simulator and she can deliver breech twins and have a postpartum hemorrhage and an eclamptic seizure uh, all, all in a short afternoon. So lots of opportunities for training. We also have multiple standardized patients, many of whom are professional actors. So they're very talented and they can really add a lot to the physicality of simulation training. We have some moulage expertise that's not actually monkeypox. That's just from a simulation that we did for the emergency department. Um, and we do a lot of interprofessional simulation. So we, this is one that we did for ECMO transfer. So this involved the ICU, the ECMO team, and the Mayo Clinic Transport Service. We do a lot of in situ simulation as well. And sometimes that means just, you know, having a, a code in the, in the family medicine clinic, but also we work with several external partners. So this is some work that we did with the SpaceX teams for uh, recovering astronauts on the recovery boat. We are an accredited simulation th center through the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. And we also have an accredited, accredited simulation fellowship. We offer a resident elective, and this has been really popular, um, both for you know the opportunity to patch your procedure uh, logs, but also because it's a great way to learn simulation as a teacher. Um, so lots of opportunities, and it's very popular among rising chief residents. We also offer faculty development courses, and these are available to you as a trainee, but they're also available to your, your faculty. So it really helps to develop um, people's teaching skills. We offer debriefing workshops as well. And these are great for simulation debriefing, but they're also great for life skills. I think I use my debriefing skills on my kids just as much as I use them on my trainees. Um, this is our website here. I'd love to have you take a look at it. This is my email and this is Lori Rice's. Uh, she's my administrative partner. That's her email as well. So we're so excited to get the chance to work with you and hope to see you next year. Thank you, Dr. Simon. It's hard to believe it's been 12 years that the Simulation Center has been providing services, uh, not only to graduate medical education, but to our community. So thank you for bringing us up to date and sharing those exciting developments. Our next speaker is another colleague that I work with in graduate medical education, and that's Dr. Jamila Donnell. Dr. Donnell is the operations manager 
for graduate medical education here in Florida. She is also an assistant professor of medical education, and she's going to describe some exciting work that we've been doing regarding service learning. Dr. Donald. Thank you. Um, well, good evening, everyone. So I'm very excited to tell you about another one of my passions. So um, it's an opportunity to engage communities through an initiative called service learning. So service learning has a very specific definition, but in general, uh, it combines um, learning objectives with community engagement. So it is not volunteerism, but it really provides an opportunity for the learner to engage communities as part of their curriculum and to receive credit while doing so. Um, we have two pathways at Mayo Clinic. So the first is experiential opportunities. So in this example, we have local, national, and international elective rotations. And I'll tell you more about what that will look like um, as an opportunity. On the didactic side, there is a health equity curriculum. So we have a longitudinal six month program. Um, we're in the second year of that program. We're also launching next year health equity tracks, which will be embedded into existing programs. And typically this would occur in multi-year programs. And then finally, later this year, we're launching some just-in-time modules. And these are video modules that are very topic specific. Um, and they will be provided to programs to use at their discretion to meet um, specific ACGME and other accreditation body requirements. And so for the first option where the trainee can engage the community locally, um, so this can occur at any of our Mayo Clinic campuses. Uh, in this example, the residency or fellowship program makes a commitment that all trainees in their program will participate will participate to some degree in their training program. And this typically takes um, place in the phase of a um, of a recurring off-campus rotation, typically four weeks in nature. And in this instance, the program is matching a community need with a training program requirement. And so I have on the screen just a few examples across all of our Mayo Clinic campuses where we have GME learners. So there are many additional opportunities, but this is just sort of a sample. And you'll see that there are some that are located in Jacksonville. Soulspocker is one of the primary ones located in Jacksonville, but there are others. Um, and so this provides the opportunity to sort of not have to travel far from your from your house. You can go and engage the community, you know, come back home and then maybe do so um, over the course of your training program. Or it could be once or twice during the month. It could be variable depending on what's available in your program. And the second opportunity, this is more of the immersive opportunity. So this is the opportunity to engage um communities nationally. So the two opportunities we have at Mayo Clinic is first the Winslow Indian Healthcare Center um, that services Navajo Nation in Arizona, as well as the Tuba City Regional Healthcare Center, which also services Navajo Nation in Arizona. And in this instance, the trainee is working and living in the underserved um, area. So where you're living and working with the community and the patients that you're serving. Um, it is rural and urban. Um, Mayo Clinic provides funding um, for travel to the location as well as housing and other uh, ex expenses. Um, and what we're doing is focusing on some of the rural communities that are proximate to one of our Mayo Clinic campuses. And so regardless of the, rot of the location of these rotations, any trainee, regardless of your home campus, your, your, um, you have the ability to travel and Mayo Clinic um, does fund that. Um, we're pursuing some new opportunities in the Midwest. So um, hopefully um, if you were um, to join us here at Mayo Clinic, we'll have some new opportunities in the Midwest to add to this menu of opportunities. Um, and so the third opportunity is to engage the community nationally. So this is through the Mayo International Health Program. And so MIHP provides up to $3,000 financial support in the form of a scholarship to help defray costs to um, visit communities that are, again, living in an urban, rural community internationally. All, tra all GME trainees are eligible to apply. Um, and over the course of um, MIT being in existence, um, Mayo Clinic learners have completed 559 trips to 64 plus countries. And this is at no charge to either the patient or the trainee. And so sort of um, moving into the health equity curriculum, the didactic portion of service learning. Uh, 
service uh, learning includes sort of the sort of base of understanding, um, you know, humility, um, understanding the background of the patients that you're serving. And so um, the health equity curriculum really provides that for the learners that they're understanding the type of patients that they're seeing. Um, and so some of the examples for this includes healthcare disparities, cultural humility, health literacy, implicit bias, health policy, nutrition, social determinants of health, and indigenous health. Um, these uh, curriculums run for six months, typically November to May. And at the conclusion of the curriculum, we have a virtual book club with a guest author. This year, we had the honor of having Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, who was the author of What the Eyes Don't See, um, which was about the Flint water crisis. She was a program director during this crisis, and in the book, she shares how that impacted her and her work, um, also how it impacted her trainees. Um, and so that was a great opportunity we had, and so we're looking forward to continuing that next year and having another guest author. Um, anyone that completes health equity curriculum um, is able to receive a certificate from Arizona State University. We have uh, a contract with them where we collaborate with them. And so you would receive an, a certificate in health equity. Um, in our first cohort, we had about 250 plus residents, fellows, and faculty from across all of our Mayo Clinic campuses who participated and were in the process of enrolling um, learners into the second cohort. Um, we actually spent most of the afternoon today um, completing focus groups and really hearing from trainees about the impact of the health equity curriculum on both their career paths, but also on how they are now interacting with and understanding their patients in a new way. So um, we're excited to um, share more about that um, if there are questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Donald. Community involvement is very important, and I'm very proud that Mayo Clinic uh, Graduate Medical Education is becoming increasingly involved in community and international service. It's exciting to see how that continues to grow. Our next speaker is Dr. Ivan Porter. Dr. Porter is the Assistant Dean and Chair of the Mayo Clinic School of Graduate Medical Education Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Advisory Group. He is Assistant Professor of Medicine, and he is going to talk to us now on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Porter. Yes, hello. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight and uh, giving me the update, or giving me the chance to update you on a few initiatives, priorities, goals, or a lot of different words we can use. Uh, I'm a nephrologist. Um, I've, I've been in Jacksonville since 2008 when I came here for internal medicine training. Uh, I know everybody's been talking about the beach, but some of us also like to live by the river I'm a little bit closer to downtown. There are so many good places in Jacksonville to be. So just remember that I've got a similar role to this in graduate medical education with the medical school. Um, I've also got some roles in access. Uh, all these things tied together. Um, I never pass up the opportunity to talk a little bit about Jacksonville and Jacksonville's history. And there's nothing controversial about that. Let me start with saying that. But this is the largest largest area-wise, square 840 square mile city in the United States. Okay, originally this Tamiqua territory uh, that you see there in the bottom right, um, in 1829 and then in 1830, President Andrew Jackson, who you see on the screen, uh, made a speech declaring this plan for and then signed the law uh, called the Indian Removal Act that basically had this deal to move Native Americans uh, to the other side of the Mississippi in exchange for their land. Uh, so you see, this is a political cartoon of um, Swift Scholar's travels. So it just shows people tearing apart the Cherokee Nation for what we need. And then on the left, you see uh, the city limit sign of Jacksonville being put up by the mayor uh, at that time in 1968, uh, Hans Tanzler and uh, Lee Meredith, a uh, local actress who acted at the Alhambra Theater, dinner theater that's on Beach Boulevard and uh, also had uh, a successful national career. Um, this was in the Cummer Museum of Arts and Gardens. Look, I'm saying all these Jacksonville things at once. That's the, that's the purpose for this. But the Cumber Museum is a very popular place. When we talk about the arts, it's closer to my side of town than the beach. Uh, having said that, um, 
at the time, people were concerned about whether or not this was the right picture. It, it was a picture that documented history. History just is about documenting moments in time. It's not about talking about what's politically correct or what's incorrect. And the same would go for the perspectives that people have at something like a namesake city of Jacksonville after uh, a general in Florida that never visited the city. Um, but again, well, that means nothing to a lot of people. It may mean something to some people. And I don't think there's anything wrong with seeking to gain that perspective of other individuals. I think we all end up in a better place when we do that. Um, it fitting today, um, in 1960 today, um, Axe Handle Saturday. You got, everyone should Google that because that happened at Hemming Park, now James Weldon Park in downtown Jacksonville. Um, but that'll be a good Google for you to do after this uh, residency fair. Um, and the only reason that I say that is, you know, 1960, uh, those people are still alive. People that had wrongs done to them that had no accountability are still alive today. They still live with that every day. People that were involved or had family members that were involved had never had to account for things that were done. And that's problematic. Knowing that that's problematic for someone else and why they would feel that way is probably important to how anybody can move forward in life. Just a thought. With, with the Office of Education's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, there are these overarching goals to recruit and retain diverse learners, to eradicate racism, there's an easy one, to promote a sense of belonging, and to create equi equitable opportunities for advancement, promotion. Um, so each of the schools, the School of Health Sciences, the medical school, uh, us, graduate, medical education, the School of Graduate Medical Education, we take those overarching goals and then put together what we think uh, can help us achieve those goals. And these targeted efforts at recruitment, the targeted initiatives for what we do with training, both trainees and our faculty, so faculty development would be included here, and the steps that we take to retain folks after they've trained here, all of those things play a role in what we think will advance tenets of health equity, diversity, inclusion of all of our patients. So briefly to talk about that, I mean, we start at the kindergarten level. So this is enterprise wide. That's my role deals with Arizona, uh, Minnesota, all of our sites. But there are a number of programs that start in the kindergarten years and go all the way through postgraduate years. And we foster and develop these relationships and are continuing to improve. It's more than that now. And then when you come on campus, you, you, we want you to know that we care about you and your environment, your learning environment. So it's important for you to understand the resources that are available. So we ensure that people know where to go if things aren't going the way they planned, expected, or a way that they're comfortable with, we put them in contact with the right communications to help address those problems as they come up. Sorry, this mouse is very uh, touchy, so I apologize for that. Uh, another thing is the IDARE curriculum, the Inclusion, Diversity, Anti-Racism, and Equity curriculum. So this is something that's rolled out at, at all of the schools uh, in a targeted approach um, sometimes specialty specific, sometimes just more broad, but all of them have these four competencies or pillars of trying to identify self-awareness. So we're talking about the personal uh, domain here, uh, how our personal biases interact with others and how that can affect what we do, whether we understand intersectionality, et cetera. Institutional-wise, like, uh, if you haven't heard of Rich Ties, you will. There's values of Mayo Clinic, respect, integrity, compassion, healing, teamwork, innovation, excellence, and stewardship. Do our actions match what we say our values are? And then societal. So how do we react with the other members of our society? All, all of these ways of thinking about problems and content um, allows the introduction of different perspectives and that makes us all better individuals. That's the argument I'm making at least. Recruitment programming is always offered. You you all will be offered a spot to come to the 
residency open house that focuses on DEI initiatives. We do one for fellowships every year. We do one for residencies. And we have other targeted programming as well that just tries to highlight some of our values and put it in action versus just words on a slide. Uh, We talked about the advisory group, but these are individuals not in graduate medical education that hear about concerns of those in graduate medical education. Let's look at results of climate surveys. Um, And these are diverse perspectives from many different people across the clinic in many different roles. Um, Figuring out ways to ensure equity with this new world of virtual recruitment. Being able to talk to different programs about ways to review and rank their applicants to ensure that we are not leaving anyone on the cutting room floor that shouldn't be there. And, you know, what is diversity? Why, why do we even care about diversity? Why is there a position like mine? Why is that important to us? How do we support individuals that are here, the site program, strategic identification of talent and excellence to ensure that there's a place for them on our staff so we can ensure that our staff is representative of our workforce. So faculty is what I mean, is, is representative of the workforce. And, you know, is that representative of the patient population? And that's another important thing when we think about the patient population. This is a community health needs assessment from 2022. It's done every three years. So I don't have more recent data than this, but knowing about your population is important. And this is the main catchment area that we serve at Mayo Clinic. And so knowing about the differences in education level, knowing about the differences in household incomes, let alone just demographics, are going to be very important to how you interact with the individuals that you work with and the individuals that you're going to take care of. So having said all that, I am excited about the opportunity to add more perspectives to the work that we do. Uh, I am, I urge you all to embrace the value of diversity and its role in promoting health equity, which is our goal. I think we have the opportunity to make a huge difference in a lot of different people's lives and in our communities. I hope you'll be the, there to take this journey with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Porter, and thank you for expressing so eloquently uh, how much Mayo Clinic and graduate medical education values um, diversity and equity and inclusion. I thought that was a very bold start to your talk. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Tyler Vadabankur. Dr. Vadabankur is the chair of our Learners Wellbeing Council. He is a professor of emergency medicine And he will talk to us now about training well-being. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, And it is an absolute pleasure pleasure to be here. Thank you for taking your time out of your obviously very busy medical school schedule. So as you heard, I'm the director of learner well-being at the Mayo Clinic here in Florida. I've been in my role for six years, and I've also been an emergency physician here for the past almost 19 years, believe it or not. Um, so, so Mayo Clinic in the space of well-being has been a leader, really a pioneer. Mayo was involved in healthcare provider well-being, healthcare training well-being, long before it was in the general sort of consciousness. I went to the first ever American College of Emergency Physician well-being conference just five years ago. And the plenary was all about Mayo Clinic's work. And it was delivered by somebody who doesn't work at the Mayo Clinic. Um, So very involved uh, in well-being efforts for a very long time. But I think the biggest strength that Mayo Clinic has in the space of well-being is our exceptional culture. Mayo Clinic has a deeply rooted values-based culture where professionalism, collegiality, basic respect are foundational, their expectations. So I'm very confident in saying that while we're not perfect and we're always trying to be better, that the learning environment here at Mayo Clinic in Florida is both positive and extremely healthy. So attention to well-being will permeate your entire residency 
experience. There's no doubt that your assistant program director, your chief residence, your program director will take a direct interest in your well being. Very likely, unless your program is very small, there'll be a resident well being leadership role that you might fill in a few years. We also have a graduate medical education committee that's enterprise. As Dr. Porter said, we have Arizona, Minnesota, and Florida sites. We meet monthly to discuss graduate medical education well being issues. We have the Mayo Clinic Fellows Association, which is essentially the student or trainee association for graduate medical education. You'll be hearing from them in detail in a few minutes, but they play an outsized role in well being for our trainees. Uh, They're incredibly effective at creating a sense of community uh, here on the Florida campus. We also have the Learner Well Being Council here in Florida. There are currently eight residents on our Learner Well Being Council. And our council is here to support residents in their well-being initiatives, their well-being projects, and also, and perhaps more importantly, to hear from residents about any concerns that they might have about what may, might be going on in the learning environment so that we can address those quickly and efficiently. And finally, we also have a whole office that is full-time dedicated to your well-being. Uh, that is the Office of Wellness and Academic Support where we have mental health counselors, disability and accommodation specialists, academic success advisors, and a role called the care resource manager. The care resource managers are the quarterbacks of that, of that office. And so not only do they know about all of the Mayo Clinic resources, but they also know about community resources outside of Mayo. So the bottom line is at Mayo Clinic in Florida, there will be no doubt phenomenal training in an exceptional learning environment and culture with an abundance of resources available to you in terms of your well-being. And if you choose to get involved in well-being leadership, there will also be opportunities for you uh, in that space. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vatabon Cure. Appreciate you bringing us up to date on well-being and how it's valued here. I will agree that uh, culture and the integration of care are two of the strong suits of Mayo Clinic and, and have really made my career here enjoyable. And um, I look forward to um, learning more about well-being from you and your colleagues. Our last speaker is one of our own residents, Dr. Claire Wilson. She's a PGY3 internal medicine resident. She's the chair for wellness on our Florida Mayo Fellows Association, which is an association for all of our residents and fellows. And Dr. Wilson now will tell us about resident life here at Mayo Clinic in Florida. Dr. Wilson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McKinney. And um, I just wanted to say welcome to all of the um, um, trainees here today. It's so exciting. What a great time to be in and congratulations for making it to this point. Um, so I'm honored and it's an absolute delight to be presenting to you about what's what's it like being a resident here at Mayo Clinic um, in Jacksonville. So I'm currently a third year internal medicine resident um, and I am the Mayo Fellows Association Wellness Chair. Um, so moving forward here. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm actually originally from a suburb outside of Chicago, Illinois. That's where I completed my um, medical school at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and I'm a proud Boilermaker. I did my undergraduate uh, studies at Purdue University. I'm currently applying for rheumatology fellowship. Um, and so why Mayo? Um, so I experienced firsthand um, through the care of uh, my mom about how Mayo Clinic truly puts the needs of the patient first. And after I saw um, her experience and how Mayo was there for my family personally, um, I wanted to give back to the program and train at a world-renowned facility. Um, so the three shields, research, education, and patient care truly make Mayo the best place to complete training. And here, um, you can actually see um, our little dog, Charlie, that we got earlier this year. Um, so if you have a fur baby or a pet, um, Jacksonville is a great pet friendly area um, for your fur baby. So a little bit about Mayo, Florida. Our campus is absolutely beautiful. I hope that you all get a chance to come see us in person. Um, so, you know, on the 
top left portion of the screen, you can see these beautiful flowers. Um, it seems like something different in bloom is in um, all year round. Um, we have the most gorgeous sunrises and sunsets on campus. Um, the poinsettias were um, around the holiday season. Um, I think what also makes us truly unique is the fact that we have golf carts and sometimes we go on team golf cart rides throughout the day, which is an awesome way to experience campus. We also have beautiful fountains, um, new facilities. Down here, this um, Treating the Untreatable advertisement is actually at the Jacksonville Airport. So there's a really nice airport um, about 30 minutes from campus that will get you to and from many major cities throughout the country, um, which is nice for visiting family, friends, and loved ones. Um, you'll, you'll have a lot of family and friends that want to come visit you if you, if you choose to do your training with us. Um, Florida is a great place to live and work. Um, so I'm very proud of our campus. It's one of the things I love to show my family when they come to town. So resident life in Jacksonville, you know, coming from Chicago, I was a little bit hesitant at first, um, but let me tell you, it's Jacksonville has been such a pleasant surprise. I absolutely love living here. Um, up here, you can see I actually became a Disney pass holder um, in Disney World Universal Studios are all within a two hour drive of Jacksonville. So on your weekends off, you can go there with your friends or family. Um, down here is the St. Augustine Night of Lights. So around the holiday season, St. Augustine, which is about a 30 to 40 minute drive away, hosts a beautiful um, nighttime um, lights show basically all throughout December and January, which is really nice. Up here, Congaree and Penn is actually a winery in Jacksonville. I didn't even know that that existed until last year. It's absolutely beautiful. Our beaches here are incredible. Um, obviously, St. Augustine, Jacksonville, Neptune, Atlantic Beach are all gorgeous for sunrises and sunsets. I absolutely love to do that. We have great bakeries. Um, down here is Sonati's, one of my favorite bakeries in town. Um, and restaurants. Here is um, Caps on the Water in St. Augustine. It's one of my favorite places to get some good seafood and it's very scenic on the water. And of course, we have the J Jacksonville Jaguars here. So I actually went to one of their NFL games um, last year, which was really fun. And um, this is just showing us at the internal medicine um, holiday party last year. One of our attendings hosted us all over and it was ugly Christmas sweater themed. So we all wore that. Um, and then down here, you can see some huge skeletons. So one of the houses by the beach actually decorates for Halloween every year with these huge skeletons. So even though you're in Florida, you do still get a, a taste of the seasons and the holidays. So just wanted to highlight that, that you still get to celebrate and you get that feel. Um, here is just highlighting some more um, uh, great things about being a resident in Mayo. So we have, I think, honestly, one of the best um, resources for research for a residency program. So this was me. I actually got to go to the um, American College of Rheumatology meeting last year in San Diego. So Mayo has great funding for trainees in terms of um, helping get us to different research meetings. Um, this was uh, some of our internal medicine department at the um, ACP Florida chapter meeting last year. Um, this is again just showing one of my favorite local coffee spots in town. Um, we have um, um, resident lunch conferences um, through our wellness committee where we sponsor different lunch spots throughout the Jacksonville area. So we had like a fiesta day. This was actually um, recently in the top right hand corner for the new incoming residents that came on. We met up at a local brewery. And then this is just to show there's so much to do in the Jacksonville area that I'm not even touching upon. Um, I would need more time to do that. But this is um, there's Broadway shows in the area and so much to do downtown. A lot of local um, um, big time artists come to the Jacksonville area and do different concerts. So a lot to do. And then this is some information on living. So um, the white star on this map um, is the Mayo Clinic. So. Um, I think a lot of trainees, depending on your financial situation and whether or not you have a family, some do choose to buy homes, um, rent apartments or rent homes. Some actually room together. Um, I know my husband and I, we rented our first year and then we bought a townhouse because I really would like to pursue fellowship here. So we um, planned for that. But there's a good mix, and I will say Jacksonville seems to be adding apartment complexes like every month or somewhere new that's building. It's a very popular area for young professionals to be living in. And so this map kind of shows you a lot of people do live right around the Mayo Clinic campus, but there's 
Um, the beaches, which is a popular area to live, that's about a you know 15 minute drive or so. Town center, um, which has a, an amazing selection of shops and restaurants, that's about a 20 minute drive. And then um, downtown, which is a little bit more of a 25 minute drive or so. But just know there's plenty of different areas to live in. And once you match here, um, we help you in um, providing you resources on where to look for apartments um, or homes and such. So just a little bit of information on the Mayo Fellows Association. So we are a training leadership board for current residents and fellows, and we serve as a liaison between trainees and the Mayo Clinic Education Administration. So our job is truly to advocate for trainees. We aim to ensure appropriate training representation on hospital policy initiatives and access to high quality education, wellness resources, and mentorship. The MFA is also a great organization because we help to organize uh, social events for residents and fellows throughout the year and also give trainees access to alumni networking, job recruitment, and professional development opportunities. So this is our executive board for this year. And so some um, initi init initiatives on this slide, um, we helped to get a 6% stipend increase. Um, the Mayo Clinic stipend in general is um, very, very um, high uh, according to, uh, compared to the rest of the country, I will say vacation days increased to 20 days per year from 15 days per year. Um, and then some other opportunities here, we have an annual career networking and job recruitment fair, a professional development training series where trainees get to learn um, interviewing and networking skills, as well as the monthly social events. Um, this is one of the things I'm most excited about is our new wellness center for employees. Um, as you can see here, it's absolutely beautiful. There's um, uh, free weights, treadmills, two Peloton bikes, fitness classes, and it is free and open 24-7 for employees. This is some information Dr. Um, Bankuro already talked about, our amazing um, office for academic support and well-being. But just know there are plenty of resources here at Mayo, um, including finding a local therapist, managing stress, um, helping find local support for grief and loss because life does still happen while you're in residency. So just know there are a host of resources available for trainees. This is some more of our events um, through the Mayo Fellows Association. So there's beach days, sporting events, um, different family friendly events. Um, so all of these are sponsored by the um, MFA. Again, here are some more um, of our events. The um, Bottom left one here was recently this past week, welcoming all the new fellows with our current residents. We also have a, a baseball team here in Jacksonville called the Jumbo Shrimp, um, which was a lot of fun. They have great fireworks at the end of their baseball game. So this was a great um, event. A lot of people brought their families with. Uh, we also offer grab and go lunches and breakfasts from time to time. So there's a lot um, of benefits that come with joining the Mayo Fellows Association. So um, I could talk about you know, why I'm so happy to be a resident here for time and time again, but, um, you know, I'm so thankful I'm coming at the end of my third year and I truly cannot imagine doing training anywhere else. So congratulations on, you know, making it this far. And um, I really hope to see you all next year. So thank you for this opportunity. Dr. Wilson, thank you for putting that personal touch and showing how, how much fun it is to live and work here. That was fantastic. And I want to thank all of our speakers for such a great job of uh, covering so many bases about graduate medical education and what it's like to be a resident here at Mayo Clinic in Florida. And thank you again to Dr. Mauricio for organizing tonight's uh, speakers and this um, open house residency uh, tour. Please don't leave. Now is your opportunity to take this to a, a different level by joining one of our breakout sessions. We have multiple um, programs that are going to give you an opportunity to interact with faculty and or uh, residents to um, have your questions uh, asked and answered. So be patient as the options become available on your screen. It'll take just a little bit to get everyone clicked into the right room. If you get lost, our IT support uh, will help you. So it's been great to meet all of you virtually. Look forward to seeing you here on our campus and please enjoy the breakout sessions. Take care.